Okay, we're going to get started. Good afternoon, good evening, whatever time zone you're on. Welcome to our first Ray uh, New York meetup in association with the NYC ML and AI hosted by Justin. So thanks a lot for uh, having us over there in New York. And thanks a lot for all our speakers who are actually joining us. My name is Jules Damji. I'm going to be your host today and your moderator. I'm part of the Ray Advocacy team. And those are my email address and my contact information if you want to uh, get in touch with me. So here's um, uh, the agenda today. But before we get into the agenda, I just want to sort of get uh, with some logistics today. All your mics, <clears throat> unfortunately, are muted, so we can't hear you. Uh, it's going to be sort of a one-way conversation. Uh, if you have any problems that you're actually encountering, whether the slides are not being shown or the font is too small at the meet in the um, in the notebooks, um, put something on the chat so we can actually address that. If you have any questions for the speakers, normally at the end, put them in the Q&A because that way it's a lot easier for me to moderate them rather than on chat because otherwise it would just go up and down and I might lose that. So put all your questions in the Q&A. If you wanna tell us where you're from, just uh, put something on the chat and let us know where you're heading from. Uh, we like to uh, know uh, where where people are sort of you know dialing in from. So feel free to, Feel free to let us know, say hello on the chat, and that way we know that, that we can actually hear you. Okay, so today's agenda, um, we've got two speakers. I'm just going to go quickly over some of the upcoming events and some of the things that are happening in the Ray community. And then we'll have our first talk by um, uh, Max and Federico. Max is the CEO and the founder of Nixla. Uh, he's going to talk about how they actually do forecasting and get scale with Ray. And then Federico is also going to be part of the second half of this presentation. That's going to be followed by um, by Daft J. Chai, who is the CEO and the founder of Eventual. He's going to give us, you know, what is Daft uh, is all about and why they actually chose Ray as a native uh, Python data frame. And then that way um, we can actually find out how people are actually using using Dask uh, or using using Daft at scale and also why people are using Ray and time series at scale. So those are gonna be the two main topics. Just as part of our upcoming events, we have Summit coming up again in, in September. Uh, early bird registration is started. So those of you guys who wanna save some money, go ahead and uh, uh, look at this particular URL and sign up. Uh, we have a three day uh, conference. The two days are the sessions and then the third day is going to be where we actually have training. So we have six training sessions happening. It'll be actually an exciting three-day event. So don't miss it out. <clears throat> it's in September in San Francisco. Good reason to come. We won't have rain. We won't have trees falling down. So I think that's going to be good. Uh, we have keynotes that we actually announced. We just announced uh, Adrian Gomez, who is the co-founder of uh, Cohere, and and Brian McClinton, who is also beginning joining us. So we've got uh, three astounding keynotes along with other founders, uh, Robert and Jon Storka, who's going to be giving over the keynote. So don't miss this opportunity to join and join the global community. I think it's going to be an exciting time to be a part of the community. A few other things are coming up. We also have an AWS Loft and any scale rate event tomorrow in New York. And I believe Max is going to be there, correct? Yeah, so Max is going to be there. So you can get to hear him again twice in a row if you miss anything today. And if you're there in person, we will ask questions. And then we're repeating the event the following week in San Francisco at the AWS Loft. So it's going to be pretty much the same exciting way to find out what the Ray community is working on and who are the vendors who are actually using Ray in any sale at scale. So this is actually a good opportunity for you to to meet and mingle and, and meet the rest of the uh, crew. Another meetup coming up, <clears throat> uh, Spotify is a big user of Ray. They actually have been using Ray for a long time and they also built an entire platform they call uh, use cases. They actually use a Ponder on it. So this is actually a good meetup to talk about how they're actually using Ponder with Ray and why they actually went with Ray. So it's a good opportunity to find out uh, how you can actually use that. Another uh, couple of things that are happening this week, as you know, generative AI has really taken off, has been sort of capturing the media lines of what people are actually working on generative AI. And we wanted to sort of tell a story of how Ray fits in into this grand scheme of things. And some of you probably don't know, but you know, OpenAI and, and Cohere and Electra actually use Ray to actually build a GPT model. So this is sort of a way of, of telling the story. What are the challenges involved in 
in dealing with generative AI workloads and how you can actually do things at scale. So we have a three-part blog series which are going out. The first went out yesterday, which sort of lays out the foundation about what generative AI is going and how Ray fits in the grand scheme of things. What are some of the challenges involved when you're dealing with large models of billions of parameters and you're dealing with workloads such as inferencing and training and, and fine-tuning and all that. So that is in, in blog one. The second blog, which went out today, was a talk that we actually gave at the GTC conference today, where we're actually using Alpine Ray to, to do a train over a thousand GPU scale of 175 billion parameter or PGA model. So that's actually a, a, a quite interesting blog that you should actually got. And then the third one is going to be how we actually use and fine tune uh, diffusion AI using, using Ray. So these are sort of good technical engineering uh, series of blogs going out. Two have gone out this week and, and one is going to be going out uh, on the following. So just go to uh, www.anyscale.com.blog and you'll actually see part one and part two. Uh, finally, two books are out or are O'Reilly. Um, I think tomorrow we're actually having book signing. So if you come tomorrow at the event, you might be able to grab a book and, and meet the author, one of the authors over there. I believe that in New York City. And then we have another book. Uh, by Holden Corral, which is a big open source advocate, and she works at Netflix and her author Boris. So those are the two books available. So you can actually reveal all your knowledge in Ray, and and let's go uh, let's go buy those books. Uh, this this is a good way to 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 up to your skills on Ray. And then finally, a lot of things are actually happening in the community. You know, this is one of the ways where we actually communicate and and meet once once a month every Thursday. And so if you want to have, join us at either Slack channel or join our discussion group or join, follow us on Twitter, this is the way to join us. And just like any other open source conferences or any other in-person, we actually have a code of conduct. We are very strictly adhering to those. And so we just want to make sure that uh, I'm going to leave up there for about a couple of seconds so you actually have a chance to read it. This is all about our conduct to make sure that we adhere to it and we, we really follow it uh, word by word. So I'm going to leave it there for a couple of seconds and then we'll get started with Max as our first speakers on how they actually use uh, Ray and why they use Ray and what, what are the problems that time series and force casting allows you to do. Okay, with that now, I'm going to start sharing the screen and I'm going to have uh, Max take over from here. All you Thank you very much. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, um, I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jules, for, for the introduction and thank you to all the participants for being here. We're very excited to talk to you about uh, how to use Ray and NixLab to open source, we think two amazing open source projects to do scalable uh, time series forecasting. And, all, and, and then you could also start doing other uh, time series related tasks like anomaly detection. So in summary, what we're gonna do and learn today is we will explore how to scale time series tasks ac across different distributed uh, machines using this uh, two technologies, Ray and Nixla. A brief definition before we start, time series forecasting is normally defined as the process of using historical data to predict future trends or patterns in time-dependent data. This is normally how time series data looks like. It has a classical components like seasonalities, trends, noise, and what we're trying to do is understand the past and maybe the influence of some exogenous variables to predict future distributions of the target variable. Uh, this has many different use cases. Uh, time series are uh, really the operational DNA of the world. Everything that is not unstructured data, everything that is uh, tabular data can be understood as time series data. So it's widely used in healthcare, uh, finance, uh, telemetry, observability, e-commerce, retail, ETC. The most prominent use cases for time series applications are forecasting and anomaly detection. Today, we're going to be focusing on, on forecasting. And normally, uh, we try to separate uh, forecasting tasks into two big categories. There are strategic forecasting problems and operational forecasting problems. Uh, this is this is a separation that is done by Jan Gashaus and, and Tim Janukowski, who worked at Amazon and, and helped create the AWS forecast. The main difference between strategic and operational forecast is that strategic forecast normally is done using local models. 
That means that a single model or a couple of models are trained for every unique combination of time series. Uh, here, a unique combination of time series could be the lowest granularity of the data that is available. So to bring it back to the real world, imagine you are a retailer and you have different products and different stores, and those products are part of categories and brands. And then uh, the, 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 the lowest granularity that you could have is making forecast at a product store level, because every uh, that, that would be a unique time series. Then you could start aggregating in different hierarchies, like uh, all uh, one product in all the different stores, or one brand for every store, or one brand for every different store, and that's how you start. How, that's how you start building uh, hierarchies in time series related tasks. Well, strategic forecasting is normally done when you have few uh, unique combinations of ITs, and you can start or train um, local models for every one of them. If you start having a lot more of SKUs and a lot more of different stores, like for example, Amazon, 200 million SKUs across uh, uh, thousands of locations, then local models start to be very hard to train, very hard to evaluate, and they don't really scale that well. So that's when you start using global models. And, and I'm gonna exemplify what I mean with this graph. A local model uh, means that you are feeding one individual model for every series. A global model means that you are feeding one model for one or many series. Examples of the first ones are classical autoregressive models like Arima, Arimax, but also other prominent uh, statistical models like ETS and maybe even Facebook Profit. Global models are uh, what we normally refer to as classical machine learning models like grading uh, uh, boosting trees or uh, uh, also newer uh, developments in, in deep learning like uh, DeepAR, uh, NBeats, or even some of the models that we have helped created like the N hits. Well, that's, that's the introduction to the problem. Why is it important? Because it's widely used. Why is it a challenging? Because with the new availability of data and the growing availability of data, scalability becomes an issue. In the first, uh, and in the second, for both local and global models, scaling this sort of algorithms, doing a cross-validation at scale is not a trivial task. And one of, way, one of the ways that we have found is most helpful to address this is by using distributed computing engines like, like Ray and uh, libraries that have been created from the beginning or designed from the beginning, designed from the beginning to address the problems of scalability. And one of the, the projects that we think, uh, or that we, 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 did, we started Nixla, the, the time series project or time series ecosystem with that whole idea in mind. And we created this time series ecosystem that helps address uh, the problems that I just mentioned and offers a wide variety of models in the classical statistical families, but also for newer uh, machine learning models and neural forecasting models. So today we're gonna be uh, showing you how to uh, set up an environment in, in any scale or a rate cluster, how to train uh, local models, and then how to train global models. And at the end, we're gonna show you some tooling around a, a model performance evaluation. So the first thing that we did is we created um, uh, uh, an account here at any scale. It's really a very intuitive uh, interface. Then we're gonna be creating a, a cluster. And once we have a cluster, then we can open uh, a Jupyter notebook that is connected to that cluster. That's what we show up here in this in this notebook. By the way, very importantly, this, this notebook is gonna be shared with you. So you don't have to to, to take any notes, we're gonna share everything that we are presenting. So the first thing that we do is we set up the environment by creating this cluster on any scale. We are defining certain dependencies that we need. In this case, we're gonna be using this particular image that you see there, this particular Docker image with this three libraries. In this case, we're gonna run the examples using seven instances of these machines. These machines have 16 cores and 64 gigabytes of RAM. 
Once we have set up uh, the data, we can start playing around with it. In this particular case, we're gonna prepare the data. We're gonna use a, a very famous benchmark data set from the N5 uh, competition that actually has real uh, sales data from Walmart at the um, SKU level for different uh, stores. The data is publicly available under this URL. And the first thing that we need to start playing around with this data set on a distributed matter is initiating in it this, uh, this ray cluster. Uh, we can access the dashboard here and see that everything is running. And uh, we can start uh, reading the data with this simple uh, read part get uh, command. Here you have uh, the, the head or the first uh, series. As you can see, we have unique ID. In this case, the unique ID is product uh, product number one from the foods category in this particular store, namely California store one. There are N stores in California and other 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 locations. Uh, to begin with, we're going to do some data exploration. Everything that we're doing here is just selecting some IDs so we can plot the series. As you can see, uh, this is classical time series data. Uh, for those of you who work in the in the industry, you're going to notice that this particular data set exhibits classical characteristics of retail data, namely that it's uh, sparse, uh, that it has uh, some important gaps in, in missing values, and uh, that is it's 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 a hard problem in terms of, of fitting different models. So the first thing that we recommend uh, doing while working with time series data is fitting local models. As I was explaining at the beginning, before Nick's slide was very hard to fit local statistical models in a distributed matter because the existing libraries didn't or weren't built for scale level uh, computations. And that's uh, what we created. As you can see, really uh, to start <clears throat> uh, forecasting, uh, 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 it's very easy. In, in this particular case, we're gonna be importing three models, the auto ETS, the dynamic optimized data, and the seasonal naive. And we're gonna be fitting all of these three models for all 30,000 series. That means we're gonna be fitting 90,000 uh, models. The only thing that you need to do is to instantiate the stats forecast class. It takes uh, the list of models that we defined previously, the frequency of the data, and we have an interesting parameter called the fallback model, which is very helpful for uh, time series forecasting at scale, given that some of these models might fail for specific series if the series contains, for example, too few values. So in case one of these models fails, uh, automatically the stats forecast class is gonna replace that model with a, with a fault tolerant model like decisional uh, naive. <clears throat> One of the interesting features of the Nixla of the Nixla verse is that we designed all the libraries to take this format of of this input format, where you have a unique ID that identifies the series, a date stamp, and the value that you're trying to predict. If you want to include exogenous variables, you can also do that with with other columns. But the important thing here is that you can have one unified data frame, where you can fit. Uh, many different models. So uh, if you work with other libraries before, you're going to realize that one of the main difference is that you don't have to iterate through all the different unique IDs and then iterate through all the different models, but you can fit uh, three models for all different series in one single call. So the only thing that you need to do is really focus on this uh, stats forecast class dot forecast method where we pass the data set that we read before we established that we want to predict the next 28 uh, horizons and we compared it to pandas for easier, uh, easier manipulation. Uh, what you see here before is the way that we connect to the to the to the few uh, to the ray uh, cluster and here the the time calls are there so we can see how long it takes to fit this 90,000 uh, models. And as you can see uh, we were able to fit 90,000 models, a little bit more than 90,000 models in under 20 minutes with uh, uh, using uh, seven machines. In here, we took a screenshot of the dashboard when we were training this, of the AnyScale dashboard, and you can see that CPU utilization is quite high and that the computation are being uh, very efficiently distributed across the different uh, machines. 
Uh, here is how the forecast looks like. We have the unique ID and we have the timestamps of the future. Uh, and then we have the values for uh, the different uh, uh, models. This, this, this format makes it very easy to evaluate the performance uh, of, the, of the forecast. We just need to, to create this evaluation function that is gonna do some data wrangling and it's gonna uh, give us uh, the different uh, errors for uh, the different models. In this particular case, uh, don't be distracted by the fact that we have different levels. This is a, a peculiarity of the data set that we are using. The way it is evaluated, given that it's hierarchical, is across levels, as I was explaining at the beginning. But we can focus on this column, namely total, and see the different uh, error metrics that we have uh, for weighted root mean square uh, uh, error metrics in this, in this, uh, uh, for this particular models. So, in summary, it took us around 18 minutes to train uh, the baseline models that we're going to be using. As you can see here, the best performing model is the ETS, and then the worst performing model is the seasonal naive. This means that we have a value added uh, of using these models above a certain baseline. But now we want to see if we can improve efficiency and or accuracy using global models as we were explaining at the beginning. So we, we already have a strong baseline for this Walmart data set. We already were able to predict the next 28 observations for this big retailer. Now we want to start iterating and make it better. We're going to use two uh, or three very famous machine learning models. We're going to establish a baseline uh, with a linear regression. Here, it's very important to, to mention, and this is something that we just released for, for this uh, conference today, Nick's last ML forecast now supports all models for, from SKLearn. So you can use linear regression, but you could also use support vector machines or nearest neighbors or whatever you want to use, uh, LASSO, uh, ETC. Uh, but we are also announcing that you can now use native, uh, the native integration of LightGBM and XGBoost from Ray with Nick's last ML forecast to distribute all your different uh, time series tasks. So what we're doing now is we're gonna use uh, these three models to fit all 30,000 series and evaluate that. One of the amazing things of, of, the, of, the, of the stats forecast class is that it makes it very easy to instantiate and do a whole uh, uh, pipeline for ML distributed uh, tasks. So the only thing that you need to do is create a list with the models that we're gonna be using. Obviously you have to import them before. Uh, define the frequency, same as the stats forecast. And then uh, this particular step uh, can be very complicated when you are not using uh, Nix Last ML. If you want to create features for your machine learning tasks, like create lags or lags transforms, this could be a whole pipeline. We support a lag uh, feature, feature engineering natively inside the uh, uh, ML forecast class. The only thing that you need to do is establish the lag values that you want to use. In this case, we're going to use one week and four weeks in the past. Why? Because uh, 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 monthly seasonality and weekly seasonality might be very important for uh, retail data. And then we can create certain lag transforms like rolling means for the seven day rolling mean, 28 rolling mean, but also a seasonal rolling means for different combinations. This here is a very powerful feature we think of the ML forecast class. So, so feel free to play around with it and, and use it. And uh, you can also create date features, for example, a year, quarter, month, week, day, and day of week. And at the end, the only thing that we need uh, to uh, have this uh, distributed ML forecast object instantiated is uh, specify the engine configuration. Don't, don't focus too much on, on this. Again, this is how we communicate with array clusters. So you just need to establish the number of partitions that you want to use. Uh, once you have established the, the, the ML forecast class or the distributed ML forecast class, you simply call the fit a method on that class by passing it the ray series that we defined before, identifying the unique ID column, identifying the timestamp column, identifying the target column, and then we can simply call the ML forecast.predict for the next 28 uh, observations. And 
uh, we're going to see that one of the promises that we did at the beginning, namely that global models are faster, does indeed uh, hold. Uh, the whole uh, pipeline takes uh, 9.7 minutes. So we are uh, a little bit below uh, uh, the total time of the statistical methods. This means this is twice as fast as uh, the first attempt that we did it. And it's also being, uh, it's using very efficiently all the different uh, resources that we have available for computation. The forecast looks the same. We have the unique ID, date stamp, and the different values for the models that we used. This is, this is a great feature because this means that you can easily append the results from stats forecast and the results for ML forecast to do evaluation. And here we do the exact same function, evaluate the, the different error metrics for the models. And we can see that uh, using the XGBoost forecast, we can achieve a 3% improvement over statistical methods and gain 100% improvement in terms of a computational uh, efficiency. The, the wonderful thing is that we don't have to stop there. We can take the best of the two worlds and create an ensemble. Um, I'm not going to spend that much time explaining why ensembles are good, but they help, in summary, increase accuracy. They make the predictions more robust. They also uh, improve generalization uh, uh, features of, of the forecast, and they offer certain flexibility. In this case, we're going to introduce one of the simplest ensembles that, that one can make, namely take all the different predictions that we generated and create a, a median. So the only thing that we are doing is creating, taking the median value for all of these different forecasts. And here you can see we have a new model, namely this median ensemble, which is nothing else but a median uh, aggregation of the of the of the former models. And here we show um, a way to, to calculate the the improvement. And uh, at the end, you can see that uh, you can achieve uh, a four percent improvement of over the best global model. So you can achieve a significant improvement uh, over uh, baselines and a very good improvement uh, in respect to classical statistical methods and classical uh, model uh, glo global methods. So in summary, uh, this notebook shows how you can leverage the power of a distributed engine like Ray and uh, distributed libraries like ML forecast from Nixla and stats forecast for Nixla from Nixla to create an end-to-end -end pipeline uh, to create to, to do uh, forecasts at scale. So again, here we are forecasting more than 30,000 series, the whole M5 competition, in under 30 minutes, achieving a, a wonderful results. By using this exact pipeline and uh, including exogenous variables that are also available in the competition, you could actually uh, be in the top 5% uh, of the M5 uh, leaderboard. So uh, we encourage you to go and, and try this uh, for yourself. And if there is uh, time for questions, we wanted to keep the presentation short and, and give you uh, the opportunity to to, to, to ask uh, your questions to me or to Fede. Thank you very much, Jules. That would be our presentation. Thanks a lot, Max. Uh, thanks a lot for the very detailed technical presentation of how we are actually using the notebook and how you could actually scale uh, at, a, 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 at the level that you were thinking about using, using the Scale and Ray cluster. Uh, I don't see any question, but I think there are a couple of things popped into my mind. When you showed the diagram about, you know, forecasting has sort of two different Parts one is the one is the strategy and the other one is operational. Right, you have this little tree that actually says operational models and strategic models. In your um, in your working with 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 people who you, you uh, who are doing this, where do you think is the ratio? Are people building more strategic models? Are people are building more operational models? Or there is an uh, even even uh, distribution of that? Jim, I. I think we have seen more people trying to build strategic models. Mm -hmm. uh, the classical approach of using statistical uh, models for time series. But one of the uh, hidden agendas that we have by creating this uh, technologies and, and pairing it with uh, technologies like Ray is to really make the boundaries um, more blurry. Mm -hmm. 
Because I think that what you can achieve now with uh, stats forecast uh, with distributed engines engines is you can really start fitting uh, thousands of of or, or even millions of series. We have published different benchmarks where we show that you can use Ray and, and Nixla to forecast uh, or do baseline models in on more than one million series in less than thirty minutes. And and I think that's why we are seeing more and more companies uh, replacing their entire forecasting systems with uh, Nixla and doing both strategic and operational and then assembling. So so to to make the answer very concise, we think like right now, 70% of the people are doing strategic, 30% are doing operational, but we forecast that more and more people are going to start using both and leveraging Mm -hmm. the best. Old, uh, approaches. Okay, and when you were when you when you were showing all the time series data, in did you actually use any, any particular toolkit? Uh, you know, the, the the little vertical lines, or was it something that's actually part of the ML for ML uh, ML forest? Yeah. Yes, this is this is actually a, a utility that we use in a, a, from the stats forecast library. Okay, it's a okay. that we have. And it's very nice because uh, you can do like explorations here and 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 you can also it, it has some nice features that takes a uh, random series and plots them uh, so it, it's very useful for for edas you can also specify a uh a, a latex uh, engine so you can print this this is this is javascript using plotly under the hood mm-hmm. but but this is part of the of the stats forecast uh, package now is that is that something they have to install pip install it actually comes as part of the uh the the next level, uh, package it's part of the stats forecast package so if you okay. install the, yeah if you yeah if, if if you just import from them you should be able to use the utility yeah so the the only the only three requirements to reproduce everything here is obviously ray and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so it seems, it seems like you know when i looked at when i looked at the way you were actually uh, training the model you're actually using a different function and the same data, right? So you actually have the same data set, but you were sharding certain data based on on unique ID. This could be a zip code, or this could be in a financial district. This could be a stock uh, identification, right? And so you would actually have these three different models for you know ten amount of stock series over a period of time. That you can actually do forecasting. Is that is that the correct way of putting it? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, that's that's the whole idea behind it. You can take one data frame with all your different stock data or all your different retail data, and in 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 a few line of a few lines of code, fit uh, three statistical models and three machine learning models, and then assemble them. And 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 we think that's great because you don't have to do a lot of data wrangling to start gaining the best of the statistical world and the uh, machine learning world. Right. Um... Okay, I see. A, I see a question from uh, uh, oh, our, our one of our panelists. So, so, do you see companies serving these thousands of models at once for live predictions, or would they be hosting it thousands of microservices to do this? We we have seen both, Jay, and that's that's a very interesting question. We have seen we have seen the following. We have seen people rerunning the models. Uh, uh, every every I don't know five minutes and trying to do near real time anomaly detection, and they are like not, not even serving the models but retraining them on on the spot. Uh, this is more expensive in terms of computation, but it's more accurate because you are including the latest observations. That's that we have seen that in production, and one very uh, right here, one very big right sharing company is doing that. We have also seen people or companies that pre-train the models and then expose them globally and do distributed uh, inference. So they distribute the calls uh, for like online uh, uh, predictions. And then we have also seen <laughs> a more edge use cases where people pre-training on a different data set and doing transfer learning for time series. And, and, and in that particular case, uh, we have seen microservices that take the the api call and try to resolve it on the pre-trained model and and but the microservices part is more on the like api calls than on the real model training or model inference but i don't know if that was clear jay yeah does that answer your question 
Yeah, very cool. Thanks. Uh, one last question before we actually go on. So you, you you showed that you actually abstracted your 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 DL forest class. You have a top level Python class that you actually created, and then you really decoratively sort of define all the parameters that you actually want this to train on. How does that how does that translate to to where you actually how are you using Ray? So does this does this translate into a Ray actor that actually goes ahead, goes ahead and does a distributed training? Could you just go one level below and, and say what Ray core functionality that you're actually using to do the distributed training? Are you using tasks? Are you using Ray actors to do the, this remote distributed training? Um, Better you, you want to answer this one? Yeah, sure. So basically, we are we are using an amazing library which mm -hmm. is uh, called uh, Fugue, mm -hmm. and and Fugue allows you to to distribute the the pre-processing part of the, for example, the ML forecast library, mm -hmm. and in an efficient uh, manner. So you only have to pass the Ray dataset, and, mm -hmm. and Fugue uh, handles the 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 partitioning and the distribution part of the of the pre-processing, and and after that, once the 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 pre-processing data is 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 ready then uh, we just simply call uh, the the model we want to to fit and after that the the third part of the of the pipeline basically uses the fitted model to um to generate the the, the predictions again using using fugue yeah so so, so fugue is the one that actually does does the the implementation of Ray actors and Ray tasks to distribute it across the Ray, Ray cluster. So yes, presumably, exactly. it's presumably it's taking your uh, your declarative parameters and creating a Ray task to go ahead and create a function. So Fuge is the one that's doing the orchestrating and talking to the Ray cluster. Is that exactly. is, okay? All right. Yeah. There's another question from Farzad. Where are some of the new development for Nixla packages that you are looking forward to in 2023? Uh, yep. Yeah, thank you. We we have a, a a very active member in the community called Farsat. If if that's you, thank you for all your contributions. If if not, we invite you to be part of the community and help us build that. Uh, so we're gonna be trying to find the most requested features uh, that we have been uh, hearing for the community and try to integrate them in the different libraries. So that's, that's you're gonna see a lot of us trying to be more responsive to the community and integrating features that they are asking for. More generally speaking, you can expect conformal prediction in all of the three libraries, stats forecast, ML forecast, neural forecast. You can exp expect multivariate deep learning models in your forecast. That's going to be exciting because it offers the possibility to start thinking about causal or Granger causal relationships in data. And that's exciting. Uh, in terms of stats forecast, uh, we have a couple of models that we want to include. TBATS, I think it's the last big model that we need. Mm -hmm. um, and in ML forecast, you can expect more work on, on the documentation. And in general, in all three libraries, we want to work a little bit around helping people deploy this into production. So for example, being able to save uh, pre-trained models and call forward methods on, on them and uh, uh, used, uh, and include them in unified pipelines so you can run all three libraries in a big pipeline. So those those are the general ideas for, for the next uh, months for us. Thank you for your question. Uh, Max, one last question before we move on. Um, I know you're based in New York and forecasting uh, financial markets is, is huge there. Are you actually seeing any clients who are actually using Nixla today to do the forecasting of folks? I know this is, I mean, if it's if it's a proprietary question that you can't answer, then you don't have to. But but in, in, in terms of where is the big use cases of people actually using Nixla today? Yeah, we're... If there, there are different use cases in different industries, but I'm, I'm going to speak more about the financial thing because I think it's, it's, it's better for the audience. Mm -hmm. We are indeed working with some uh, financial researchers to see how we could use Nixlat to forecast certain uh, derivative metrics of financial ma markets. Uh, that being said, uh, we think one of the <laughs> riskiest uh, things that you can do with time series is assume that you can simply take Nixla and Ray and forecast the stock market and start trading. So if you are doing that, don't do that. It's probably not going to work. And then in terms of who is using us in that uh, market, it's very hard to say because one of the 
like secrets of the quantitative hedge funds is the algorithms that they use to forecast. So if tomorrow JP Morgan would say like, hey, yeah, we're using Autorimas to forecast the market with this and this exogenous variables, then the whole like secret mystic around uh, such a hedge fund would fall. So, so we don't know if they are using us, and if they are using us, they are not going to tell us. So, so <laughs> it's going to maybe have... maybe that question will come up tomorrow because you're going to have live audience. Uh, probably <laughs> a lot of them come from the financial market. One last question, I promise. One last question before Jay comes on. Um, how do I get started with Nixla? I mean, um, can you can you share something on the uh, on the chat with where they should where they should go if they actually wanted to download? Nixla, uh, what's the GitHub URL and and uh, how do I start getting to the documentation? Thank you, uh, Jules. I'm I'm gonna prepare a little a little message here on the on the chat uh, so people can just click right, it. Right, right, right. Or alternatively, alternatively, you know, what you can do is actually um, share a couple of slides with me along with the URL to the to the uh, to the notebook, and then I'll I'll post it as part of the uh, presentation along with the video and share it with the community. So anybody who's attended can actually get to the URL and get all the documentation, all the resources they actually need for them to get started with Nixla and Ray. And then um, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll share that along with the notebook. With that said, thanks a lot, Federico, and thanks a lot, Max, uh, for your wonderful presentation. Quite insightful to see how forecasting has been done at scale, both using Ray and especially Ray at any scale. And uh, hopefully, you have the uh, we have a good live audience tomorrow as well. So good luck tomorrow. All right, Jay, you're next. All right. Very sad that I'm not going to get rich off Ray and Nixla and just forecasting the stock market. <laughs> but um, cool. So yeah, uh, let me share the screen. But yeah, so I'm really excited today to present to everybody uh, DAFT, which is the Python distributed data frame for complex data. Um, DAFT is a data frame library like you know Pandas or Polars or PySpark, if you've used those. It's fairly uh, young. It's a fairly young project. It's about 5.0. And it runs completely distributed on Ray Core. And that's why we're here talking. Um, I'm especially excited to give this talk because DAFT, I think, is really complementary to all of the uh, Ray ecosystem, like Ray Data, Ray Tune, Ray Serve, and we hope it can be you know, useful to you as part of your toolkit when you work with data in Ray. Um, so a little bit about me. So my name is Jay. I am a co-founder at Eventual Computing, um, and I was a software lead at Freenome uh, and Lyft Level 5. Uh, that was in biotech and in autonomous driving, and I've been building you know, these distributed data systems for machine learning for a while now, and uh, uh, across these interesting domains where you have like genomic data and like LIDAR data and images. And uh, that kind of uh, uh, prompted me to think about like, hey, what would working with these pieces of complex data look like at scale? And that's why we built DAFT. And so now I'm a maintainer of DAFT. And uh, yeah, we, we love data frames and we think that data frames are kind of the future uh, for, for data processing. Um, and so yeah, let's dive a little bit deeper. What is DAFT really? So. I'm gonna throw out a few descriptions and, and we'll go a bit deeper into uh, some of them. Um, so DAFT is a Python library, right? You can pip install it, use it from your notebooks. You just do that using pip install get DAFT. Um, it is a data frame. So if you're familiar with uh, data frame libraries, they have, you know, they're made of tables. Every table has rows and columns. Uh, you can do operations like join them together. You can, you know, filter the rows, you can filter the columns, modify the columns, uh, et cetera. Um, DAFT is by default distributed uh, with Ray, and so you can run it on a cluster of machines using Ray, right, to leverage more hardware and even GPUs uh, for larger data sets. Um, and last of all, which is really interesting, DAFT is built for complex data, uh, which is not something you usually see uh, with a lot of these data frame libraries. So the idea with DAFT is that why should, you know, images be any different from my strings? Why should videos be any different from my numbers? Right? You should just be able to put all of them in a data frame and work with them as if they were part of this data frame. And so sometimes it's easier for me to think of DAFT as just this like table, right, where you have like, images in the columns, you have, you know, PDFs or documents in the columns, uh, JSONs, protobufs, audio files, and all that. And you can kind of visualize DAFT as being this giant distributed table of this uh, complex data. So I'll give a little uh, deeper dive into what we mean when we say complex data. Uh, we see that data kind of lies on the spectrum right, between primitive and complex. On the most primitive end of things, we have, you know, in most programming languages, you have primitive data types that are atomic, like integers, like 42, strings like true, 
um, a float value like uh, pi here, 3.14, and uh, booleans like true and false. And when you want data to be more useful, you start composing them right into these objects. And, um, and, and so then they start taking on some additional meaning. For example, when you put two numbers together into a latitude longitude, it doesn't just it isn't just a pair of numbers anymore. It now represents a location on Earth, right? A geographical coordinate. Or when you're trying to represent a person and you put a string together with a uh, a, a number that could be the person's name and the person's age, right? And then when you get to the most complex end of the spectrum with something like an image, um, really you can think of an image as being composed of these primitives, which is maybe a height, a width, then a buffer of uh, pixel values, right? Which is just numbers. And so there's a lot of primitives in there, but at, at, at the core of it, it's uh, fairly structured and, and you know, just made up a lot of a lot more primitives. And so with complex data, um, these are the things that make data complex. First of all, it's composed of more primitives. Um, an image, for example, could have you know, a million pixels, and that's a lot more primitives uh, per item in your, in your data set right, compared to just a single number. Um, oftentimes, complex data has very domain-specific semantics. So the example we gave from before, um, a geographical coordinate, right? Uh, it's more than just a pair of numbers. Um, you know, you can uh, think of it as a location on Earth. And because it's domain-specific, you want to run domain-specific functions on it. For example, give me the, the zip code of this geographical coordinate. Or, you know, give me the distance between two geographical coordinates, right? Those are all very domain-specific uh, uh, functions and, and, and um, algorithms that you will be running. And last of all, uh, complex data is often very hard to represent. I have here an example of videos, and videos are surprisingly hard to represent um, because you have kind of these anchor frames and then you have this, these diff frames in between uh, uh, in, in order for you to be able to access the data that you want to access. And so how does DAFT help here? Right, so first of all, because complex data is just composed of more uh, primitives and it's just larger, and requires more compute, we can actually leverage RAID for distributed computing, right? And that, that gives us the ability to use more cores, more GPUs to process uh, complex data. Um, we also have uh, lazy execution and query optimization to efficiently run your queries and, and make sure that you know, we're not running any uh, extra unneeded computation. Um, Secondly, to, uh, to address the issue that complex data is often very domain specific, we allow you to run any arbitrary Python function as what we call a UDF or user defined function in uh, DAFT. Uh, we're also working on a lot of interesting complex data kernels, right? So, you know, kernels, for example, to crop images or to convert images between color spaces, and that's coming soon. Um, and lastly, uh, which is a really interesting problem that complex data is hard to represent, uh, coming soon also, DAFT will be working on a lot of uh, complex data types for you to represent things such as images, tensors, documents, embeddings, uh, and these interesting data types uh, as native DAF types in your column. So why why am I here? Why why are we talking about DAF at a Ray conference uh, at Ray meetup? Well, uh, you know DAF works really really well with Ray, um, and we leverage all of Ray core to to do this. Um, and this also means that DAF will work really well with all of your existing Ray tooling like Ray datasets, Ray Tune, and Ray Surf since it runs on the same cluster and uses the same abstractions uh, to run, right? So under the hood, let's peek a little bit under the hood, how does DAFT work? Um, really DAFT is just this like kind of a virtual table and it points to these partitions of smaller tables, which we call uh, partitions, uh, and we store them on the Ray cluster as uh, Ray objects. And these uh, partitions are actually just in the Apache arrow format. If this looks familiar to you, you might be uh, familiar with the Ray dataset, which actually looks very similar, right? A Ray dataset is also kind of this like big, uh, I guess, a collection of partitions, and the partitions are also made out of arrow. And that means that conversion between a DAF data frame and a Ray dataset is super easy. And we'll see that a little bit more in the demo, um, but yeah, it's very cheap. And, and that allows you to kind of interoperate DAFT with your training and machine learning pipelines really effectively. And that's how we see DAFT fitting into the whole ecosystem, right? So for this demo, we'll see an example of how we can use DAFT to query a, uh, your data storage. In this case, we're querying the Coco uh, image, image data set. And then we can do all, all the querying and joining and filters, you know, ETL, data processing, or analytics, uh, interactive data science. And then when we're ready to do machine learning, we can kind of hand that off. Uh, by converting into a Ray data set and then do everything machine learning related in Ray, pipe it back into DAFT to do uh, you know, any analytics or, or uh, 
uh, you know, um, evaluating our model performance. And so let's pop straight into our demo. Um, and this is kind of the overview of the demo, but um, for everyone who is not maybe as familiar with the uh, Coco dataset, this is kind of what that looks like. It's a bunch of images with, um, you know, the segmentation masks on each image, which tells you also uh, what kind of object it is. And for example, these are dogs. And also it gives you a box over a, 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 a kind of a rectangular box uh, to surround these images. Uh, with DAF, what we can do is that we can query this entire data set, um, do any pre-processing that we need to do. For example, here we're actually going to do a bunch of crops and crop out these uh, individual objects. And then we can, um, you know, perform things such as data set curation. We can curate maybe a data set of like just dogs or curate a data set of just uh, people. And then lastly, it's, DAF is also just really powerful at, you know, exploring your data and understanding your data interactively uh, in a notebook. Um, so first of all, uh, we'll just import Daft. And then since this is a Ray meetup, uh, we're going to be immediately using Daft uh, with Ray. And I'm going to define a few flags here. But um, the important bit is this bit, where we're going to tell Daft to set the runner to Ray, and we pass in an address. Currently, I'm going to pass in none, because I'm going to run everything just on my laptop for now. We'll connect to a remote cluster later. Um, but right now, everything will be running on my laptop. And we can tell. Uh, Daft to read from these parquet files, which I have stored in S3. Um, and then once it's done reading the files, you'll see that Daft actually knows the schema of these files, but it will tell you there's no data to display yet because Daft is lazy, right? It won't actually execute until you tell it to uh, go and run, essentially. And so now we can say like, Daft, you know, show me, show me the rows, show me the money. And uh, here we go. We have eight rows here. I was just showing the first eight rows. and um, I think there are about eight columns as well. And, and this, this specific data frame, the annotations data frame, is made out of a bunch of boxes, right, on the images. These are image IDs. And then there's also a bunch of other columns here, such as the category ID. This tells you what kind of object this is. And then uh, a bunch of segmentation polygons, uh, which we won't be using for this demo. But um, so let's go ahead and run some, you know, very traditional kind of relational style analytics. So the first thing we might, we might want to do is ask the question, hey, like for these category IDs, how many objects are there in this data set? Like, can we group by the category IDs and just count them? And so Daft exposes this group by syntax, group by act, and then we'll sort by the count and we'll show the first 10 rows. And we'll see that category ID one actually massively outweighs all the other objects. And this is actually uh, people, and that's why there's so many of them. Um, and so what we actually can notice that this data set is fairly imbalanced uh, in, in favor of category ID one. Um, one thing we're going to do now is we're going to filter the data set for category IDs less than 10. And we'll see that Daft has this really powerful expressions syntax, right, where you can access a column just like this by giving it uh, square brackets and give it the column name. And then you can use the column to say, hey, I only want columns uh, that are less than 10, and then you pass that into the data frame uh, syntax. And then secondly, we're just going to limit it to just uh, the category ID, the bounding box, and image ID columns. And uh, I'm going to run dot collect, which will then materialize our entire data frame in memory. And this is what our data frame right now it looks like. Um, and it has a category ID, all of which are under 10, and just these three columns, which are the boxes on these images. Um, cool. And so how does it kind of work under the hood? Let's peek a little bit under the hood um, and see how Daft does what it does. Um, really all Daft is doing is it's constructing this thing we call a logical plan. Um, and that plan currently looks like this. We have this projection that we just ran for just three columns. We have a filter operation where we were saying we want rows where the uh, category ID is less than 10. And then there's a scan uh, plan, right? Which is Daft saying, I'm going to be scanning a file. Um, and so what happens under the hood is when you tell Daft to execute, what it will do is it will translate this plan into a bunch of Ray function calls, essentially, that it then farms out onto the Ray cluster. And that's how Daft leverages Ray for distributed computing. Um, one really cool thing is because Daft is lazy and uh, uh, can you know, construct this plan, what it will do is that it can perform query optimization. Right? So we'll see the optimized form of this plan by passing in this flag. And you'll notice that Daft does some really interesting things. In this case, specifically, what it can do is it can say, hey, looks like you only need three columns 
I'm going to only read these three columns when I'm scanning the parquet file, right? So then it will, you know, avoid scanning the rest of the columns. And there are a whole bunch of these really powerful uh, query optimizations that that can do for you um, that, that we leverage uh, throughout this tutorial kind of transparently under the hood. You don't have to think about it. DAF does it intelligently. Okay, now that we're done kind of peeking under the hood there, uh, let's carry on with the tutorial. So we're going to join our uh, annotations data frame with the images data frame, right? We want the actual images for each uh, box, uh, box that we have. And so we're going to run a dot join, which is a very familiar operation if you've ever worked with tables. Um, and then we're going to select just a few uh, columns to look at. And so we'll see now that we have the box, the category ID, and now we also have the image itself, right? Which is the uh, URL. Uh, so yeah, more accurately, it's not the image itself. It's a, a, a URL, which is a pointer to the image, um, which we can resolve later on. All right. Now we're going to run some simple repartitioning, which will allow Daft to run in parallel across all these partitions. And because we're running just on my laptop and I want this demo to actually proceed in a time efficient manner, we're going to limit the number of rows to just 128 for now. Um, and the, again, this is the data frame we're working with. Cool. Now, all of that we could have done in any kind of uh, relational um, data frame library or in SQL, really. What makes DAF so special? It's the ability to work with complex data types, right? And uh, this here, this URL is actually an example of complex data type. If you think about it, this URL isn't just a string. It actually, actually represents a location, right? Uh, a, 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 a pointer to a file. And and when you work with these pointers, one common operation you might want to do is download data from that, from that pointer. Right? And Daft makes it really easy to do that because you can just say, hey, Daft, for this Coco URL column, right, I'm going to call .url.download. And what that will do is it will now return a new column called image bytes, and we'll see that Daft will just download the data for you um, as bytes. And this works for you know, these HTTP URLs. It also works for S3 URLs and local file paths as well. Um, and then going from these bytes now to images, uh, we can run these Python functions in Daft. And so I defined a very simple function here to go from bytes to a pill image. Uh, and again, we run the same kind of with column apply syntax. Uh, apply here just says run this Python function uh, on, on my column, on my image bytes column. Right now when we call that show, we'll see, voila, we have images. And so we kind of went from URL to images. And I think that was like five lines of code, uh, but we can do even more which is, um, you know, one thing we'll want to do is you want to crop uh, these boxes and then we'll want to convert those cropped images into uh, NumPy arrays, right? For pre-processing for training, essentially. And so again, we run a crop. Here we're using a Daft UDF, which allows you to define a function that picks in columns as input. Um, and so this will run the crop. As we can see, now all these are small crops from this image. Um, looks like there's a person here, which is, uh, you know, annotation label one. And then now we can convert these crops into NumPy, right? With a, again, a very simple function and we'll call dot apply on uh, the cropped image. And so now our data frame looks like this, where we have these URLs, um, the original image, the cropped image, and then we have these NumPy arrays, which are all the same shape. Great, so the data is now pre-processed, right? It's ready for training. We have all these um, NumPy arrays that, that are like well-formed and, and are all cleaned up and ready for training. And so to convert, uh, this data frame into a ray data set, all you need to do is call this dot to ray data set, right? It's super simple. Here we're also just selecting two columns, the NumPy array column and the category ID column, and then we're re renaming them. But now, yeah, you have a, uh, you know, run of the mill ray data set. And really all you need to do with this is pipe it into ray. Um, and so I literally just copied and pasted uh, ray uh, airs image classification tutorial so that I can run it and show you that this actually runs. Um, and all of this right now is running on my local laptop. So it's going to run some training. So this is Ray running training. It should complete in about 10 seconds or so, because it only runs two epochs. And remember, we only have 128 rows right now. Um, and then here is where it stores the results of training, the checkpoint. And we're going to use the results of training to evaluate uh, our model again on the, on the training data set. And we have now a data set that is the evaluated result of our trained model, right? This isn't as useful, so we can actually go the other way, which is to convert a Ray data set back into Daft, right? And all you have to do is call data frame dot from Ray data set. Uh, again, it's very cheap to compute. Um, 
because of the underlying data representations. And this is what the data looks like, right? We have these predictions produced by our model and the actual ground truth label. And so we'll do some pre-processing to convert these predictions from these NumPy arrays, one hot encoded NumPy arrays into uh, numbers. Uh, so it's easier to work with. That looks like this. Right now the predictions are all nice and just numbers. And now we want to compare the predictions with the labels to make sure that they are correct. So again, we run a very simple Daft expression syntax to compare these two columns and make sure that they're equal. Um, we cast them to integers so that they're either zero or one. And lastly, to see how well our uh, crappy small model performed, we can call, you know, uh, group by the label and then sum on the number of correct rows. Um, obviously, it didn't perform that well because we're only trading on 128 rows and we're running everything locally and only ran two epochs. Um, so our model does very, very badly. And now we can actually maybe just go back, restart the entire notebook, and we can run on the entire data set by leveraging uh, uh, Ray and run it remotely so that we have way more compute. So let me clear all the cells and we can start again. Um, so same thing, import daft. And this time, instead of uh, running locally, I'm going to run remotely. Uh, so I have proxy locally to a Ray cluster that I'm running uh, in my own uh, my, my own Ray cluster. Um, and we can uh, run this cell, which will is just your usual Ray init, right? So I'm connecting to the Ray cluster now. I'm making sure to, uh, to install Daft in the Ray cluster. Um, and then now I connect Daft to that Ray cluster. And you'll notice now, uh, Ray tells me I have now 32 CPUs, right? So way more compute than I would have uh, just locally. So really from here on out, all the code is the same. We can load the data in just as we did before. Um, the data is the same as well, right? This is just this annotations uh, data frame. We can query the data frame, run the same group bys to count uh, the number of um, uh, occurrences per label. Uh, we can run the same, you know, uh, filtering and selection on the annotations data frame. And then we will be joining the annotations data frame with the image data frame. Same thing, no change in syntax whatsoever. It's the same operations, just uh, now it's, it's executing in the remote Ray cluster on 32 cores instead of locally. And uh, we'll do a repartition again. And this is the one part where it's different, where we're not going to limit it to 128 rows anymore. Instead, our data frame now has uh, 15,000 rows, right? So a lot more data uh, that we'll be running on. And this is what the data, uh, data frame currently looks like. Um, 15,000 rows, uh, same kind of schema uh, that we were working with before. Cool, and then we're gonna go ahead, download all the data um, with this URL download. That data looks like this, with this new bytes column. And we are going to load that as uh, images, just like that. So now we have image, and then we're gonna do a crop and conversion to NumPy, just as we did before. And now we have this data frame again. And lastly, we're, we're gonna convert it to a Ray data set, just like we did before. And we can look at the schema of that Ray data set once we're done with that. So it'll take a little bit of time to run because there's a lot more data now. Oh, looks like we had an error. Uh, it's probably because the uh, Coco data set is storing is returning a none for yeah. So the Coco data set now uh, is returning a none. So we can actually just rerun it, I think, and it should uh, be more well behaved. Let's try it again. All right, so our data frame is running again. Hopefully this time the Coco CDN is well behaved and doesn't throw an error when we try to access the data. Cool, it worked this time. And now we have this trading data set uh, that we can now pipe into Ray. And so we're gonna, we're gonna be running the same Ray training pipeline. I hit the code because it's a lot of code here. Um, but once that's done, it takes about 30 seconds, I believe, to train. Um, and then we can take a look at the uh, model weights and uh, then run evaluation again. So yeah, this is training spinning up. And we can take a look at what Ray is doing. So 
uh, this is the, the, the Ray cluster, and then it re it's requesting for 17 CPUs. Um, I'm actually running 16 workers at, for training. Um, and so this is Ray doing its training, the first iteration, second iteration. We'll notice here also that um, now the, the checkpoint is stored in S3 uh, because this training happened uh, remotely. And so the checkpoint goes to a remote storage in S3. And so when we run the evaluation, it's going to download that checkpoint and then run model evaluation. And once model evaluation is finished, we'll have this uh, model evaluation results as a Ray dataset, um, which we can then type in back into Daft and run uh, Daft uh, kind of reporting again. So again, same kind of data frame where we have these one hot encoding, um, except that now we have 15,000 results, right? Because we ran model evaluation on 15,000 rows. We'll run some pre-processing to uh, convert those one hot encodings into these uh, numbers so we can compare them. Then now we can um, run the same analytics to figure out how well our model did. So it seems like our model is doing a lot better now, but what, it, what it's doing now is actually it's predicting everybody as a human. Um, and so, you know, um, uh, if we had trained the model for a much longer time, uh, it would have performed a lot better, but just for the sake of this demo, um, that's, that's what I did. But yeah, so that's, that was kind of the demo to show how easy it is to work with uh, uh, Ray using Daft as kind of this engine for running all your data frame operations and all your uh, querying and analytics. So um, back to the slides. So just as a recap, how we used Daft here is that Daft kind of sits between uh, your Ray data and Ray ML uh, ecosystem and your data storage, right? So you will use Daft to do things such as querying your data, right? Join your tables, filter your tables, uh, process your data. Uh, we can actually use GPUs as well in Daft and you can request that as a resource. Um, and you can do a lot of these ETL style jobs where you join two tables together and materialize a new table uh, for future downstream consumption. And then you can also do analytics with group buys and, and things you usually do in SQL. And also it's just really nice for interactive data science where you're just working out of a notebook. Um, and then when you're ready to kind of, uh, you know, pass the data off into a machine learning training uh, ecosystem, which is where Ray data sets and Ray Air really shines, you can just hand that off using the uh, Ray to Ray data set uh, uh, function call in Daft. Um, so kind of some of the things that we have on our roadmap, uh, we're in the process of uh, writing a lot of the core code in Rust um, so that we have you know, performance increases and just like better civilization. Um, we're also working on what's really interesting, uh, which is the native complex types. Um, so you can now call it, you know, uh, this column is an image, like I want to convert it to an embedding, right? or this column is a tensor, I want to calculate like cosine distances. And lastly, we're working on like really nice integrations with Ray, Ray datasets to do kind of end-to-end -end lazy uh, evaluation within Ray datasets. Um, and that's it. Yeah, if you like what you see, come chat with us. My email's on this slide. It's j at adventurecomputing.com. And, you know, we'll be around at Ray Summit. Uh, so come talk to us and we'll hopefully be able to tell you guys more about uh, Daft Architecture and kind of how we built this on Ray. I'm looking forward to seeing you then. Thank you, Jay. Wonderful. I did like the seamless integration and flow between changing the data sets, handing it over to Ray to do all the uh, heavy lifting for Ray training using Ray data sets and also very integration with Ray Air and then coming back. It seems like you actually have built an entire DSL on top of uh, Yeah. I mean, uh, it, 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 it felt like, you know, coming from Spark background, it felt like I was looking at the Spark data frame doing all the DSL credits, <laughs> right? And then pretty, when you much. Yeah. And when you when you when you mentioned that what we're doing, because I was thinking, okay, so I, I see, you know, I see all the I see I see the projection, I see the group by do select. I do all those things, and it, it it felt very much like as if I was actually doing a DSL. And then and then you talked about where we create a logical plan, and then we go through uh, optimization to create a more more conjoined plan. Um, do you do any kind of push down predicates if you actually needed to do a projection, or say if you're reading in a parquet file, for example? Yeah. Presumably, presumably you 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 you're allowing to read things from parquet file. If I do a projection, then you're probably going to do a push down predicate for that. Yeah, 100%. Um, so we do things such as projection uh, predicate pushdown. So if you have a query that can be pushed down into the parquet layer, or if you're using something like Delta Lake or Iceberg, um, mm -hmm. then we could do that pushdown for you. 
Um, we also are thinking of really interesting pushdowns in the realm of more like complex data. Right? For example, if you are interested in uh, images only mm-hmm. of a certain size, right, then we can right. kind of push that down into the query right. as well. Make sure that right. we don't load any images uh, beyond a certain size. So, right. So it seems like currently, I mean, your data store is like this abstract store, right? You have connectors to Delta Lake, you have connectors right. to Lake House, you have connectors to uh, probably Snowflake uh, down the road. or you... That's right. So my data could be actually sitting anywhere, right? Which is, which is currently unstructured. And, and you're using DAF to do, I, would you say you, you can use DAF to do both EDA as well as ETL? And then once you have... Mm-hmm. We process that particular data, you can store it back. Is there a way you can actually write it back or you have to write it to a, a real data set and then store it as a parquet or from within the, within the data frame, you can save it as a... Yeah. So we, we think of DAF as like the Switzerland uh, of data. So we're sitting <laughs> in between all these other like places. Mm-hmm. We're neutral, right? We're, mm-hmm. We don't care where your data came from. We'll query it, we'll process it, and then we'll spit it back out. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so DAF is kind of the Switzerland. Um, but what makes Ray really interesting for us is that, like, I think traditionally it's been kind of hard to go from your data warehouse into Ray uh, itself and, and processing, especially these like, image types and all that. And that transition is kind of hard. And so by being kind of the Switzerland that sits in between everything, we have the ability to uh, make sure that we can access uh, all the data really efficiently. Um, in the future, we are thinking of more efficient ways of storing data on disk in S3. Um, and so that will be, you know, how can we efficiently uh, encode uh, images, for example, maybe instead of having a million images sitting around in S3, mm-hmm. how can we efficiently, you know, like compact them and store them efficiently. So that's kind of in the future. But for now, DAF is a purely kind of compute query engine uh, on top of these other. Uh, I mean, it actually make, it definitely actually makes sense. Like like you say, it, it sort of sits between, you know, your, your, your downstream uh, data ingestion after you've done some initial analytics. Because the Ray data sets is not really an ETL query language. It has few high level uh, things that you can actually do for pre-processing. Whereas, whereas you know, the DAF sort of provides kind of a full blown DSL so you can actually have SQL like query. And so if you're reading data from, from an SQL engine, you can actually somehow mimic that kind of analytics. Um, in, terms of, in terms of the size, I mean, you gave me an idea about how the Coco data sets, what is the largest kind of data set you actually have worked with, you have done some analytics and where you have handed off eventually to, to Ray Data to, to do the distributed training. Um, have you yeah. worked on? So, um, so we've worked with uh, benchmark mm-hmm. data sets like the PC, TPCH data sets and, and the like, and we've worked with you know up to terabytes worth of data. Um, so it's fairly performant there. I will say that there are a lot of optimizations we haven't made yet. Um, mm-hmm. So there's a lot of still room for us to grow in that area. Right. But like we're fairly right. performant now, I think comparable to Apache Spark and, and right. Uh, right. benchmarks. Right. And you mentioned something in the roadmap, you actually have sub- certain things that you're planning to do, more integration to re- re- rate data set. What were you thinking? I mean, could, oh. you, could you talk a little more about, is this, oh, is yeah. this, the new, is this a new uh, execution engine that we have, which takes care of the streaming? Uh, right, 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 okay. exactly. So yeah, you, you, yeah. you've tickled, tickled my inner nerd. Um, <laughs> the, idea, the idea is that like right now, all of the real data set integrations require you to materialize, including us actually, right, right, right. require you to materialize before, uh, before you convert it. Um, but there's actually no reason why we wouldn't be able to go fully kind of lazy from your parquet store into Daft, into real data sets, right? right and so right. the idea is that uh, in real data sets, when you request for the first partition, it goes to Daft and says, I need, I need just one partition. And then Daft goes all the way down to the store and says, I need one partition. And so we kind of fully end-to-end streaming and lazy uh, down to the read data sets. And which is very, a very nice pattern uh, for in the case where you don't have enough like cluster memory to you know, materialize everything all at once, um, which is what currently all the engines do. So we're, we're very excited about that particular uh, development. So when you when you when you do a, a data frame repartitioning, does it actually then map one to one to Ray dataset partitioning? Yes, it does. That's the beauty of it, exactly. Yeah, okay. We don't, so we don't you... do anything special. It's almost yeah. almost a zero copy where like the data at rest in Ray, we just convert it into the Ray datasets format, which is also Arrow, and then we just pass it up to Ray datasets. Yeah, so I think anybody who's sort of coming from you know either either, either Spark data data frame background or or, or Pandas data frame or modern would feel very comfortable in terms of using the Daft data frame because it's not like as if you're learning something new, you already have familiar with 
with the DSL kind of uh, mm -hmm. syntax and again, the semantics, the, your term was DSL semantics. So you can actually use that part of it. I yeah, like that. that that's the hope and uh, we're really looking forward to building a lot more interesting kernels mm -hmm. so for example like image kernels for cropping for converting mm -hmm. images to embeddings mm -hmm. um, video kernels for like sampling images mm -hmm. um, and so all of these will be all of these will be building kind of in rust and make them really performant so that users you'll never have to touch like pill.crop or like you know pill.2numpy and figure all that out it should all just be contained within our dsl for all, most of the pre-processing operations Lovely. I don't see any questions from the audience. Uh, those are all the questions I had, but I think this was a, a good good demo to see the you know the, the Switzerland sitting and uh, neg negotiating with the data warehouse and, and and Ray. And I like the way that you could actually seamlessly work with the small data sets. And when you're ready to see that, you can actually hand it off, hand it off to Ray Cluster to do things at massive scale. So thanks a lot for sharing with us, and thanks a lot for sharing with the community. Uh, I don't see any questions coming up, but um, if we don't have anything, maybe we can just end early. But I do want to thank Max and Federico for joining us and uh, uh, you taking the time, uh, Jay, to, to share with us where DAFT fits in into the grand scheme of things. And uh, hope to see you soon at the Ray Summit. And Max, yeah. I'll see I'll, I'll I'll see you I'll see you in Data Council. Oh no, Jay, you're going to be there as well. I'm going to be there so, too. So yeah. all, all of us are going to be there. So brilliant. We're hoping to <laughs> see you all of you next. We're next week in person. And thanks a lot for joining. And those of you who joined us from New York and California, thanks a lot for joining us. And hope to see you again in a month. Like I said, this is a Ray meetup. This is all about how Ray is being used by the community. And these are the people who are actually using. Ray at scale and then sharing the story with us. So if you do want to have a talk, if you do have a story that you actually want to share with us, um, contact me, jules at nscale.com and we'll try to feature you in at one of the talks. So thanks a lot and um, ciao and see you tomorrow or, or next week. Bye, thank you everyone. Thank you.